Hey guys, Leanna here. If you recognize the load screen, this is Bayonetta 2. There is no game sound in this video uh, for multiple reasons, but I didn't want there to be a lot of heavy cross chatter in this. It's bothered some people in the past, and I want to show an extended cutscene from Bayonetta 2 to sort of be relevant to this whole discussion by opposition, if you will. Um, Obviously, Bayonetta 2 is a, is a controversial character, and I believe that that's because she's a very clearly defined character, and I think this is really slick, by the way. It's a really slick opening to the game. I haven't played very much of this game yet because I just got it, and Nintendo doesn't have a partnership program, and it's a pain in the ass to set up the capture, but that's neither here nor there. Let's do this. Um, I want to talk today about a request I got to speak about the whole, you know, latest feminist frequency thing about the sword and sorcery, the name of the, uh, the name of the game, there's a character called the Scythian or the Scythian, um, and it's basically a blank slate character that Anita Sarkeesian is claiming is positive, um, and people are like, what do you think, do a video about that. I'm going to go with this indirectly because I don't want to spend my life being the anti-Anita. Okay, try to understand that. Uh, you know, I like characters like Bayonetta. I think this opening scene is absolutely fabulous because she has so much personality. And if you know anything about Bayonetta and you know anything about the Bayonetta franchise, there's this whole perception is reality thing uh, going on. Her priorities as an individual are not the same as an average person's. She doesn't have the limitations we do, but she has restrictions on her that means she doesn't entirely have true free will uh, because of the, the contracts and, and all that stuff. So she's very interesting and the more I play Bayonetta games the more I'm impressed by the fact that they they didn't just create a you know a character that's designed to be looked at they created a, a very very interesting character here and she's gonna ruffle feathers because she is so sexual but that's part of what I like about her you know, I like the fact that she's flashy. I like the fact that she shoves numerous body parts in people's faces. Uh, it makes sense based on her story. And I think that creators should be able to create big, iconic characters like this. I like her. What, I, what I'm amazed at is how quickly these games make you like Bayonetta before you know very much about her and it's it's through scenes like this that are comical they're colorful I mean she's got pizzazz a lot of really cool things happen and it's just like an action movie gone to a thousand nobody really rides a motorcycle like this nobody your hair would get ca caught in the wheel and you'd have a terrible accident it would be horribly disfiguring painful but Bayonetta doesn't exist in the real world right Bayonetta exists in the world of fantasy and Momo's gonna jump up hello Momo yes hi um, so, uh, you know, this is the polar opposite of, of the blank slate characters that some people tend to favor because they don't challenge the player very much in terms of whether or not you like them. I mean, Gordon Freeman in Half-Life, Chell from, from Portal... And then we have characters like, you know, the, the Scythian. Although technically Link is a silent protagonist as well, unless you count sort of Whoa, as the, the noises he makes. Or, those little grunty noises they make in Zelda so they don't have to localize the voices. You know, the silent protagonists are quite popular. Although the Scythian isn't totally a silent protagonist or a black blank slate, there, there is some dialogue. I personally think it's not very well written dialogue. I, I actually believe it or not the little bits I've seen of Sword and Sorcery, the, the Scythian comes off as a bubblehead to me. But but that's just me. 
you know, um, and, and I don't think that was the intention of the character. I just think it was sort of bad writing. But I'm going to put that aside for now because I can't prove it, right? That was just my first impressions, and I have no... Uh, I have no interest in, in playing that game all the way through to see if I'm right, right? That Just consider that an observation. I wouldn't even call it an opinion. It's just sort of an off-the-cuff remark. I want to focus more on whether a blank slate character, in general, can be considered a good character because of the unique gameplay element in games that makes traditional literary or cinematic analysis really not completely appropriate for games. And this is, I, I've written about this in the past. I've written about how we have to deal with games differently. And I admit, I, I checked myself on this one because at first I went, how can a blank slate character be a good character? It's a blank slate. It is inherently a neutral character. And then I thought, well, that's not necessarily true in a game. Because we have that gameplay, we have the actions of a character speaking for, for you. I love this part, by the way, coming up. I love this. Check this out. Wait for it. Wait for it. She kicks the freaking plane. That's awesome. That's awesome. And this is why I love Bayonetta, because she has to have the personality to pull off making you believe she's a person who can kick a fucking plane. But that works for this game, because this game is very over the top, very extreme in all ways, right? And then I think of a, of a very different game, like a moody game like Shadow of the Colossus right where the character doesn't say anything and um this this is going to get lewd shield your eyes yeah shield your eyes if if you're bothered by nudity this part personally made me laugh but you know some people may be offended i warned you just to the nick of time yeah okay there we go that's a pretty horse now some people would say that that's male gaze, that's bad. Uh, that really has nothing to do with her as a character, and, and I think this series turns that sort of thing on its ear. Um, th there's this constant uh, interplay with, with Bayonetta's sexuality and, and her abilities as a warrior. So I, I personally think it's an interesting usage. Is it what is classified as male gaze? Sure. Is it bad? Does it demean her as a character? Surprisingly not. And that really impresses me uh, from a, a media analysis perspective. It, it's, you know, look what happened. They had this moment where, oh, it's this moment where you, you'd normally uh, de-empower a woman by stripping her down. But in this game, that's the moment where she becomes... Uh, you know, a warrior of time, space, and death. I'm going to skip through this because, oh, it won't let me. I have to land one. Uh, okay. Uh, and, I mean, this, this is obviously a matter of taste regarding whether or not you, you enjoy watching that sort of content. But, I mean, even the guns on the boots, I don't know if you guys can see this. It actually is a weapon. It's not just cosmetic. The, the guns on the boots are actually a gameplay mechanic that is relevant to, because pressing or holding, uh, pressing and holding the, like that, the kick button shoots as well as the guns in her hands. So that's one of those things that costume is character is gameplay and they all muse together, merge, merge together, fuse. Merge and fuse, I got muse, that's funny. Uh, th this is the thing about games, and so as I was saying, a game like Shadow of the Colossus that merges gameplay and character in in a different way, it's also it also works, right? It works in a very different way, but it works. 
And this is why the whole thing, you know, can a, is a silent protagonist, can a silent protagonist be a good character? I find such a fascinating issue when it comes to gameplay because I'm thinking, well, you know, Shadow of the Colossus is one of those things where, is it, you know, am, am I going to say the protagonist of Shadow of the Colossus is one of my favorite characters of all time? Well, no. But it wasn't intended to be. It, it, the character served its purpose within the game. I can't even tell you the name of the character of Shadow of the Colossus, but I don't have to. It's a gameplay-driven game. The story is extremely minimal. It's one of those, there's a guy and his love is asleep. It's like a Sleeping Beauty thing and he has to fight all these, you know, giant monsters. That's the entire story of Shadow of the Colossus. That's it. And is, is it, is it going to make any top 10 character lists? No, but the character made sense in that game. It, is he a positive portrayal of a man? I, I guess, like, it's very neutral in that way. But it is an interesting issue, isn't it? It's an interesting little thought experiment, and then I start applying it to, you know, Gordon Freeman. People, I think, have forgotten that Gordon Freeman, you don't actually see his face in in the Half-Life games. He's He has an appearance for the purpose of box art. But people know what he looks like. And a lot of people refer to Gordon Freeman as an iconic video game character. And that's really interesting because I, I can tell you what sort of shoes, clothes, food Bayonetta likes. I can't tell you that about Gordon Freeman, but he's held up as one of these icons of gaming. You know, why? Because people like the game. People like to explore the game through, through being Gordon Freeman. For, for lack of a, of, of a better explanation. And this is why I love games, and this is why I love game criticism. Because these answers aren't simple. And I love that they're not simple, right? I absolutely adore that we have to have these complex things, and people accuse me of overthinking it all the time. It's really not overthinking things in the way that, you know, a movie would, because how do I put this? We, we sort of understand film and film language at this point. We're still kind of getting there with games, aren't we? You know, we, we um, don't, we don't have it locked down the same way we do with film. And that doesn't mean there's, there's no innovations to be had with film still. Of, of course there is. But, it's far more, we have common language, we have common understandings and things like that with film that, that make these debates a lot simpler. And, and there are a lot fewer moving parts with, with film and television because they're essentially linear, linear stories uh, that don't have you know, the gameplay element that video games do. And uh, that, I mean, that makes the whole thing very exciting. To me, it's a very exciting time to be a part of video games because the lack of structure has also created a ton of innovation in, in that, you know, glorious way that, and, and people are going to freak out that I make this comparison, but, you know, almost in, it, what happened there? Almost in the way that the, the, you know, the glory days of classic cinema or the golden and silver ages of comics when a lot of the, the real beauty of the whole thing came about because the people involved didn't know what they were doing in, in terms of, you know, technical expertise. They were making it up as they went along. And there's a lot of that in video games too, that, you know, somebody had to, for instance, 
come up with the you know zoom in pull out technique for us to see it as part of film language now and you know that didn't happen until somebody experimented and came up with it and we're, we're still in the process with video games and, and maybe for a very very long time because there's so many more variables with games that it's exciting it's exciting to be a part of it and and i feel very grateful to be a part of this this time with games that we we can have these discussions and we we can have really open-ended philosophical discussions about this stuff and, and 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 figure it out and be be part of it we can be part of it we're not passive viewers like we are in a film we can control outcomes in games and that's very interesting and and so i think that if i were to summarize my belief now i think that the idea that a blank slate protagonist is a good character may be going a bit far i do however think it's fair to oh i can't waggle today to save my life I do think it's fair to use examples of blank slate female protagonists as interesting uses of female playable characters in games. And I that's a different distinction. Is he Fleming on me? This is nasty. Get a lozenge or something, dude. Um, I think that... Oh, what am I supposed to be doing? Umbrun Climax. What am I doing? Oh, L, up here. Okay. Sorry, I'm still trying to figure out the Wii U controls. I don't like them, I admit. And again, me saying I don't like them isn't saying the Wii U is a bad system. It's, it's just me having a personal preference. And I think that's really important to talk about in any of these discussions that, you know, personal preference is not professional critique and it pays to know the difference. Uh, so, you know, classic example, while I personally do not prefer silent protagonists, I see their utility in games. And I'm going to die because I'm trying to play this without the sound and on this tiny little screen and I can't see it. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I will, you know, we're, we're getting into this inaccurate, language of sociology driven games criticism aren't we in in this whole issue and yes that's a a big issue i i try to use different different uh adapted modalities to be more specific because just me personally i cannot stand vague things when it comes to this stuff i just i just think it creates a mess but, uh, so yeah, we'll leave it there. I'll say my, my knee-jerk reaction was no, you can't have a positive female character if they are a blank slate. I, I still believe that for linear mediums like film, film and television, however, I, I do think that games are, are different. And I realize that the, the, you know, one of the greatest Nintendo characters, one of the most iconic Nintendo characters of all time proves me wrong in terms of my initial assessment because, you know, Samus, or is it Samus? I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce these, ga these names, guys. I've just only seen them in, in writing because when I played Metroid, they, there was no voice. But, you know, Samus is a classic example of a silent protagonist that is, you know, significant because, you know, it was that first experience of a lot of male characters, a lot of male players playing as a female character. And they didn't know they were playing as a female character. And so, you know, there's a classic example of a, a Samus didn't have a lot of um, identifiable character traits about her at the time. Certainly far less than, you know, Mega Man did, who was, I'd say, her closest proxy. But, 
she had value and she had meaning just by being an action hero who happened to be a woman. So, uh, hopefully that what, what I'm intending to do here is, is give you guys some food for thought so you can draw your own conclusions on this because I think this is an important, I think in this case it's one of those things where the discussion is actually more important than whatever conclusions people draw as an individual because people are allowed to like silent protagonists, right? Like, this isn't, uh, this character is bad. This was Anita saying, this is one of, you know, personally my, a, char a female character I enjoy. And that's fine because in this case, she's not, you know, making anybody feel bad for liking a character. So fine, it, harmless. But it did make me think, and I think that I wanted to share that because it, it is, you know, it, it does add an interesting layer to, to game thought if, if you take it to sort of a more design-based, game gameplay-relevant uh, method of critique. And I think that's cool. So now I'm going to go back to playing this game with sound because... It, it's very hard to play without the sound, but uh, thanks for watching, guys, and um, hope that gave you some tools to, to come to your own conclusions on this, because I don't like telling people what to think. I like giving people tools to think for themselves. All right, guys, now how do I get my, how do I let go of this long enough to actually turn the recorder off? Oh, God.